And I'd like to take the opportunity now to talk a little bit about uh, what, what I think many of you are quite aware of, but it's the root uh, issue, it's the, the primary cause of, of, of diseases, these pandemic diseases like COVID. But I also want to introduce uh, the journal, of course, of GeoHealth. Uh, Chi Yuan Mao is going to um, finish up this presentation by talking a little bit more about uh, GeoHealth as a journal. Uh, but I'd like to give a few uh, major points to this. Now, the American Geophysical Union is the largest society of geoscientists in the world. And our journals cover the, the range of fields that are covered in the geosciences. So we have earth and space sciences, uh, biological processes, and geohealth and effects of climate change, diseases, and pollution, for example as well as some of the human effects on the earth and the Anthropocene, so our current era of human-controlled global uh, systems. Uh, the journal itself is not, hasn't been around very long. It started in 2017, uh, and it curates this growing field of the intersection between the earth sciences and the human health sciences. And so the editors that you'll see here uh, work at that interface, work at the connection between uh, those two fields. Uh, I'm happy to say that we've already achieved some amazing milestones, including uh, receiving uh, a double award by the American uh, Publishers Program, a double prose award. But maybe more importantly, uh, we were this year, uh, well, last year, sorry, 2020, uh, we're uh, indexed in uh, in PubMed, which is a very important index, and we received our first impact factor, which was an incredibly impressive 3.66. So this is a new journal, but it has um, it has started off very strongly, and thanks to the efforts of the editors that you're going to see after me tonight. Some examples of geohealth papers uh, that that we featured in the journal over the couple of years span a range of topics. And these are just some, uh, some examples of them, uh, but uh, they range from topics related to climate change, air quality, nutrition, mining, and even, uh, even extreme weather, extreme events like, uh, like uh, wind storms and hurricanes. So if you find yourself working in an area of research that uh, relates to not only environmental and, and geoscience factors, but how that might influence human health, then journal, GeoHealth is really the journal for you. Uh, so let me go for a quick outline of what I'm going to present and then I'll quickly turn it over to one of our star editors, uh, Susan Annenberg, who's published several times in GeoHealth, a number of times, but also um, has some amazing uh, research related to air quality and uh, particularly nitrogen dioxide and COVID-19 shutdowns. So I'm going to talk, as I mentioned, about the origins of some of these issues. So climate change and human activities, uh, the concept of zoonosis, so the transfer of a disease, uh, communicable disease from a, from a non-human animal to a human being. And then finally, uh, the prospect for future outbreaks. Uh, and, and there's something that we refer colloquially in English to the bottom line, which is that uh, if it seems like this pandemic is really bad, it really is very bad. Um, some countries, like, for example, China, have been able to manage it quite successfully through severe internal measures. Others have not, like my own country, sadly. But um, this, uh, we cannot just look past COVID-19 and say, well, we'll never have another pandemic again. Because all of the ingredients that cause this one um, are setting us up for a number of other pandemics. So it's just a call for being aware that this is uh, uh, one of the sad uh, uh, sad issues with the future of climate change and environmental destruction that we have to get on top of. Now, there are a whole host of communicable diseases uh, that communicate, that transfer from human to human, that have what we call an animal intermediary. Uh, not only the 
COVID-19, which starts with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but a number of others that you're quite aware of uh, that actually take quite a toll uh, on, on, on people, on populations around the world. Uh, they all have a, a similar kind of intersecting uh, pathway. So it's between, on the bottom here, it's between what we'd call wildlife. So animals that have existed in nature throughout time that don't have any interaction normally with people. So pangolins, mosquitoes, and bats. And those that are really human, uh, are, are, are human related, including not only our livestock, pork, so pigs and chicken, as well as rats uh, and mice, which have been with us ever since we started to settle down in cities and, and collected foods, right? And it's really this transfer that is the critical component here. So we have seen a sharp increase in these, uh, these pandemic diseases over the past 100 years. And it's certainly related to two factors, two main factors. One is um, climate change and our related activities such as deforestation, habitat loss, and the loss of biodiversity, as well as well-known human practices, which includes the fact that we raise animals for meat, right? Livestock rearing, uh, the fact that we're encroaching, we're, uh, we're pushing our, our activities are pushing into wildlands. And in the final uh, issue, which has really shown up with unfortunately, COVID-19, which is the speed of travel from one place to another, where we can't actually get control over these epidemics and they become pandemics. So I'm going to focus down on uh, largely this first practice, this, this first issue, which is climate change and related activities. Um, and, and they're all in this general category of environmental pressures that cause some of these diseases. So uh, climate change uh, from human produced emissions of carbon dioxide alters, of course, the distribution of temperature and precipitation. So areas that used to be cold, some of them now are becoming warm. Areas that used to be wet, some of them are becoming dry and so forth. Uh, but climate change also causes, because it, it changes temperature and precipitation, it can cause strong issues with ecosystems, so ecosystem collapse. And we've seen this throughout the globe uh, as ecosystems that were uh, what we call habituated to a certain climate. Now the climate is no longer that present climate and the ecosystems are no longer able to function the way they used to. Climate change also causes species to migrate. Certainly, I, I don't have a chance to bring this up at this presentation, but here in the US, we've seen a severe migration of, of mosquito-borne and tick-borne diseases from the tropical areas of the US, which is on the southern part, all the way through the northern part. So this is a significant issue, right? And it generally expands the range of the vector. So things like mosquitoes, and ticks and, and uh, rats that are vectors for disease for humans. All of these are compounding these issues. Uh, particularly, I think with COVID-19, we saw, in, in, as well as, I'm sorry, as well as um, Ebola and the, and the first SARS, we saw a couple environmental pressures that were particularly uh, responsible for this pandemic. So they included deforestation as well as biodiversity and the, in the degradation of the environment. So it moves as moves endemic species uh, that used to live in wildlands right next to human populations and right next to the livestock, the chickens and the pigs that they grow. And that's a, that's a bad uh, recipe really for causing uh, diseases that that uh, can spread among populations. And one of the founding uh, editors of GeoHealth is Peter Dasek, who is a, a phenomenal expert. He worked quite a bit on the originations of COVID-19 in, in Wuhan, actually, and worked very closely with uh, Chinese researchers on these issues. But uh, they produced a, a wonderful uh, study, which just simply says, 
rampant deforestation, uncontrolled expansion of agriculture, and so forth, uh, create what we call a perfect storm for diseases to go from wildlife directly into human beings. And this is not a one-time storm. This is a continued issue that hopefully the devastation of COVID-19 will make us quite aware of and help us uh, help us work our way to stopping these pandemic diseases. So in the next several slides, I'm going to map the pathway between different practices in different countries and disease outcomes. And then I'm gonna finish up with the final two slides with talking about climate change in general. So in a sense, with pandemics, I would say that all roads really lead to climate change. Many of our past pandemics have been related to this. So uh, for example, um, uh, rampant fires in, in farmlands in the United States cause bats to leave these forests, right? Because they no longer have a habitat and then to start uh, biting or infecting uh, pigs, our, our livestock pigs, uh, which then infect a farmer. Right? That's a pathway. That same pathway has occurred in the United States already. Uh, and that's largely through human activities. Whether the forest fires are quote unquote natural or, or exacerbated by human activities, it doesn't really matter. It results in the fact that you have wild lands, wildlife very close to where we farm food. Another example, climate change related flooding in Southeast Asia expands the populations of mosquitoes, uh, which bear um, uh, avian flu, which then infect chickens and then infect the farmers or the, or the, the uh, customers that the farmers sell the chickens to. And finally, a pathway that might be more appropriate to SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, uh, the uh, deforestation and infringement on wildlands and then through some animal vectors, which ends up bringing this disease in close contact to human beings, right, in markets of some kind. All of these are related to sort of this climatic few uh, pressures on the environment. And of course, pandemics don't become pandemics unless we can travel. Uh, and in fact, that's exactly what we saw uh, before uh, we had, we were able to get on top of uh, SARS-CoV-2, it had already spread from China to Europe uh, and then from Europe to United States and also from China to United States and around the globe, right? And that's something that is uh, relatively uncontrollable. So again, I don't need to tell anybody here what causes climate change. You're well aware that our human activities have already altered the, uh, the climate of the world, and that's through our release of carbon dioxide largely into the atmosphere. Even during our very lifetimes, most of you on this webinar, um, you can see your birth date somewhere on this bottom axis. Obviously, all of you can, right? So we've strongly influenced climate. And in fact, we've influenced it on our own lifespans, okay? I was born here in the 1960s, and by the time my firstborn son uh, came out, uh, and he already had experienced a global climate that was significantly different than I did, right? Because of this increase in carbon dioxide. So that's one generation to another. But even within one generation, from my son to my daughter, it had already increased substantially. And my daughter is still in high school. She's only 18 years old. She has already seen atmospheric carbon dioxide exceed, right now it's at 415 parts per million. So she's already seen it ramp up. So um, one could argue briefly that, well, won't, won't COVID-19 help climate change because the fact that we're not traveling as much and we're not producing emissions? A little bit, or as my Chinese call, colleagues say, yijianjian. Uh, I hope I said that correctly. Uh, I don't know, but a little bit. But the whole point is that it required a complete collapse of the global um, economy to achieve only a small drop in carbon emissions, right? So much more needs to be done. 
we know that carbon, carbon concentrations obviously are strongly related to our global temperatures. That's indisputed. So uh, it, the only way to reduce this increase in temperature is to stop emitting carbon eventually, or we will have some of these more environmental destructions that have led to the ex expansion of COVID-19. Unfortunately, we've seen very little real action on this issue. These are all of the international agreements uh, that have come into place uh, since we've been aware that uh, carbon dioxide is a big issue. And I will say that um, different countries have been more forceful on this than others. I was very encouraged by Chinese, um, uh, the, the China national government's very strong pronouncements about climate change. And this is one of the ways that we can start making the future a little bit better for some of these pandemic issues. But really, I just want to leave you with the fact that we are not victims for COVID-19 or climate change. Um, we actually have a significant amount of control. And so I always think not toward myself, but to my daughter or my granddaughter or even my great granddaughter right, to project what kind of future they live in. And we know that there's a future tipping point where climate change becomes just much, so much more painful. And I would rather my, my great granddaughter be born into a world uh, where climate change is manageable rather than uh, one that it is unmanageable. So I wanna thank you all so much for listening. Well, thank you so much. Um, it is my true pleasure to be here. And um, I would like to share with you some work that uh, my group has been doing at the intersection of um, air quality, uh, COVID-19, and uh, public health, um, as well as thinking about other societal problems beyond public health, um, which are highly interrelated, and that's the problem of environmental justice. We have a, a long and um, very alarming history of uh, environmental inequity in the United States, as there exists as well in other countries. Um, and we will be talking about how the COVID-19 lockdowns provide a natural experiment to study um, the different levels of air pollution that are being experienced by different population subgroups across the United States. I want to start by thanking my collaborators on this work, Dr. Dan Goldberg and Dr. Gage Kerr from George Washington University. And this work has been sponsored by uh, NASA. And I, I really want to start by um, zooming out here and talking about how air pollution and COVID-19 interact. I think we are hearing a lot about this actually in the media as well as in scientific uh, literature. And in fact, I have never seen so many scientific studies be published so quickly as um, I am seeing right now uh, in the wake of this, well, I guess still during this pandemic. It's truly incredible to see the amount of research that was turned around so quickly to understand um, not just how air quality has changed because of the human activity changes that we're all experiencing during the pandemic, um, but also how air pollution is contributing to COVID-19. So these are this is a very simplified schematic for how, how air pollution and COVID-19 interact, but I think is instructive. So first of all, air pollution exposure can contribute to COVID-19 cases and COVID-19 severity. And uh, we have seen studies already published showing how long-term uh, concentrations of particulate matter of nitrogen dioxide and other pollutants are actually increasing risk for COVID-19 severity, including hospitalizations and death. Um, so uh, air pollution is actually a risk factor for having worse outcomes if infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, but there's other links here, too, in that uh, the physical distancing and uh, mask wearing that we're all um, going through right now uh, reduces air pollution exposure, and it also reduces COVID-19 cases and COVID-19 severity. Um, so there's many interactions here, and it's really important to conduct research to inform the public health response to COVID-19, to inform longer-term environmental policies, and to develop approaches for improving health equity. So this really provides for us a, um, it's a natural experiment. It's one that is unwanted, of course, um, but 
since we're living with it and having to deal with its repercussions, um, it does provide a, uh, a window into air quality, uh, atmospheric chemistry, and to uh, which population subgroups are experiencing what levels of, of air pollution and how air pollution interacts with infectious disease. So um, I'm going to kind of zoom back to the early stages of the pandemic, at least in the United States, um, back in March and April 2020. Um, there were a lot of, of studies coming out showing how cities had less air pollution during uh, virus lockdowns. Um, sorry, this this is not studies. These are uh, news articles. These news articles were reporting massive drops in air pollution levels during the COVID-19 lockdowns um, when we saw many people stopping uh, to uh, drive and stay close to home. Um, this is an example from uh, India showing um, how, you know, a very polluted uh, scene has now become very uh, crisp and clear. And you can see um, all of the, um, you know, all of the important historical uh, monuments. There was uh, uh, images of Los Angeles, of people actually seeing the Los Angeles skyline for the first time in, in decades. Um, and yet in D.C., where I live in Washington, D.C., we did not see very much change at all to air quality. Um, and so it was a little bit puzzling. We were trying to figure out, um, you know, again, this is back in back in March and April. Ever, nobody really understood what was happening. Um, no one knew how long this was going to take. Um, everyone was, you know, sort of scrambling to try to figure out what was going on. Um, both NASA and the European Space Agency acted very quickly to deploy their assets in space. To try to understand what were what were the air pollution changes that were being seen across different parts of the world at different times, um, so this is uh, the the first um, uh, exploration of this was in China. Of course, that's where the lockdown started first, um, and so we see from January and February we see this massive reduction in nitrogen dioxide um, in in China during the during the lockdowns. Subsequently, we had lockdowns in uh, Europe and in the United States, and these also show dramatic declines in nitrogen dioxide pollution. Um, but uh, we we did not really understand why which cities are experiencing more declines in air pollution, and why are some cities experiencing larger declines than than others. So. I want to take a step back and talk about satellite observations. There's two different kinds of uh, satellites that are um, taking measurements of the Earth's atmosphere. Polar orbiting satellites, and those are the ones that you're seeing move more here that are going around the Earth, and geostationary satellites. The polar orbiting satellites take a snapshot of every place on the Earth once per day. And that is what we have now. That's what we have observing air quality now. Um, the geostationary satellites, these are satellites that move with the Earth and uh, look at the same place on the Earth at, at all periods, at all time periods. Um, and that's more akin to sort of our weather satellites that are constantly taking images of uh, the Earth's weather. So right now, to understand air quality, we have uh, two major satellites that are taking measurements of nitrogen dioxide, and these are both polar orbiting. Um, so they're taking one snapshot per day everywhere on Earth. And the satellite instruments are called OMI, the Ozone Monitoring Instrument. That's a NASA satellite that was launched in summer 2004. And then we have TROPOMI, the Tropospheric Monitoring Instrument, which launched in fall 2017. The good news is, um, so, the, well, the first good news is that these satellites are truly revolutionizing our ability to track air pollution all around the world. It used to be that we were limited to just the, uh, just very resource intensive ground measurements of, of air pollutants, which, you know, are more plentiful in some places than, than in others. Um, the United States, China, we have many, many um, air pollution monitors, but many parts of the world are lacking any. So these satellite measurements are now taking snapshots of air pollution all around the world, even without, uh, even in places without ground ground um, observations. Um, geostationary satellites are coming soon. So we have geostationary satellites that are launching in the, in the coming years, 
And these are going to provide more spatio-temporal resolution of data over certain areas, including in East Asia, in Europe, and in uh, North America. So this, again, has transformed our ability to track air pollution. And the reason I'm going through this is because this natural experiment, this massive natural experiment that we're all living through right now coincided with a revolution in availability of air quality information around the world. So prior to this satellite record, we would not have any information about the impacts of uh, the lockdowns on air quality. I uh, look back to this book that I'm reading right now about the, the Spanish flu from uh, 1917. Um, we we have no idea about the impact of fiscal distancing back then on air quality because we don't have the measurements. But now we have these global continuous measurements from space and we can actually observe what is going on in these cities during the pandemic. Um, this right now is uh, not during the pandem pandemic, just showing some work that we were doing already before the pandemic even started. Um, just to show that we were, I mean, we, we were basically studying the satellite data in the, like the, uh, the perfect way. We were sort of set up perfectly to be able to turn around and assess what, uh, what the satellites are seeing during the pandemic and how does that compare to previous years. So go, to go into a little bit more detail about these satellites, these are snapshots of a single um, day of nitrogen dioxide from tropomi on the left and omi on the right. And as you can see, um, we have so much more information from tropomi on the left than we do from OMI. We have a much finer resolution and we have more uh, spatial, more geographic coverage. Um, and it's just incredible. You can now, even just on a single day of data, you can pick out um, major air pollution sources. And this is the East Coast of the United States. You can pick out major air pollution sources. Of course, it's still very grainy. You know, that's just one day of data. Um, and the, um, what the satellites are seeing is the entire column of contents of the atmosphere between the satellite and the Earth's surface. It's not seeing what, just what is at the surface where people breathe. But what it, it turns out that for nitrogen dioxide, the satellite, what the satellite sees, that column content, is very uh, correlated with surface concentrations. Um, so it does uh, very much indicate what people are exposed to on the ground. Now, um, this is again a single day. This is just the, the entire United States single day of nitrogen dioxide from Trovomi. And uh, you can see again, we're starting to see this, this picture emerge of, of hotspots of nitrogen dioxide concentrations. And um, you see a large part of the country is not covered, has no data. And that's because uh, the satellite cannot see through clouds. So anywhere where there's a cloud is blocking data and we don't have data. So what we can do is start to average over periods of time. And by averaging over periods of time, and we can avoid that problem of the lack of data uh, in cloudy situations. And we see a picture start to emerge like this. This is an average of the entire Trovomi record from mid-2018 to 2019 from the entire United States. And this is just, I mean, this is a revolutionary image. It's just showing um, how high nitrogen dioxide concentrations are in urban areas, um, quite low in rural areas, at least in the United States. Um, and this is giving us a spatial resolution that was never before uh, possible. So we can start to zoom in on individual cities. This is just a few US cities. We have Los Angeles, New York City, Seattle, Chicago, Denver, and Houston. And you get to start to pick out major sources of nitrogen dioxide. Where are they located? Um, which direction is their plume going? You can start to pick out major highways, major industrial areas, airports, petroleum refineries. Um, so this tells us so much about nitrogen dioxide sources that we didn't previously uh, know about. So. Um, Back to COVID-19, we had this kind of information. We were using these satellite data prior to the pandemic. And so when the pandemic started, we were able to very quickly assess um, what the satellites were seeing in terms of nitrogen dioxide concentrations. So this is a figure that my colleague Dan Goldberg put together um, back in March. And this is the first image of what we were seeing uh, in terms of nitrogen dioxide concentrations. This is what we started puzzling over. 
we saw that, you know, where you, where you see the vertical dashed line, that is where the pandemic lockdowns began. That is when the pandemic lockdowns began. They began at slightly different dates, uh, depending on where you were in the United States. And we saw for New York City, um, there wasn't very much change at all in nitrogen dioxide levels prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic. There is this, um, you know, a variation, day by day variation in nitrogen dioxide levels, and that's um, that's mostly natural. Uh, Washington D.C. We also didn't see a very large drop immediately, but then nitrogen dioxide started dropping pretty quickly after that. And then for Los Angeles, we saw this massive drop in nitrogen dioxide. So we started wondering why are we seeing these different levels of nitrogen dioxide drops during COVID-19 lockdowns, even in the same country where you would think that we have very similar nitrogen um, dioxide uh, sources. We have very uh, similar stri uh, stringency of lockdowns and ad population adherence to those lockdowns. You would think that even in the United States, you might see um, that these cities might have very similar reductions of nitrogen dioxide. Um, so this is now an image of uh, nitrogen dioxide concentrations observed from the satellite, just comparing 2020 um, uh, uh, to 2019, the year before. Anywhere where there's blue is where nitrogen dioxide is lower in 2020 compared with 2019. And you can very clearly see that in all urban areas across the United States, along that East Coast, in California, on the West Coast, we see a lot of blue. And that's where nitrogen dioxide dropped. So we wanted to understand what would this look like if meteorology was accounted for? If we could understand what was the what was the impact of weather versus human activity changes? What would this map look like? Also, what does this reveal about environmental justice issues related to air quality? So I mentioned at the beginning that we know that certain populations are exposed to higher concentrations of, of air pollutants. Uh, compared to better, uh, more wealthier, more educated, and white, whiter populations. Um, so we wanted to understand what this natural experiment it can teach us in terms of reducing those environmental inequities. And then thirdly, we wanted to understand how did varying degrees of social distancing and urban transportation changes cause these nitrogen dioxide decreases. I'm sorry for the uh, formatting on this slide, but just to say that nitrogen dioxide is a really important pollutant for a few reasons. Um, so first of all, early results are showing that air pollution contributes to COVID-19 severity and nitrogen dioxide is one key player um, in the, that uh, relationship. Nitrogen dioxide is also a very effective tracer for urban traffic. So it's very short-lived. Um, it comes mainly from traffic in urban areas. Um, and so when we see a drop in nitrogen dioxide, it probably means that there was some major change in, in traffic. Um, so we can, we can say something from this experiment. We can probably learn something about environmental policy planning. You know, how do we control emissions from transportation? Um, we can try to understand something about this using nitrogen dioxide as a tracer. Thirdly, NOx emissions are precursors to PM2.5, fine particulate matter and ground level ozone. Both PM2.5 and ozone are very ubiquitous and health damaging pollutants that are associated with a range of um, health outcomes, including even premature death. Uh, PM2.5 more associated with cardiovascular disease like stroke um, and ischemic heart disease, and ozone is more associated with respiratory diseases. Um, so NOx is a really key ingredient to the formation of PM2.5 and ozone in the atmosphere. And so to reduce the health damages of both PM2.5 and ozone, we need to reduce NOx emissions. And finally, NO2, nitrogen dioxide itself, is associated with health damages, including pediatric asthma incidents. That's new cases of asthma among children um, that would not happen were it not for traffic-related nitrogen dioxide. And then finally, it's a very convenient pollutant to study because, as I mentioned, space-based NO2 columns are highly correlated with ground-level concentrations. It's much easier to observe nitrogen dioxide from space than it is to observe PM2.5 and ozone. So we have this um, sort of confluence of this is a very important pollutant both for the, its direct health damages and its contributions to PM2.5 and ozone, and it is very observable from, from space. 
So I want to just highlight some uh, some additional work that we had done before and that continues to be ongoing, showing how important this pollution, this pollutant NO2 is um, in uh, the development of pediatric asthma incidents. So we've estimated for the first time the global burden of pediatric asthma incidents that is attributable to nitrogen dioxide pollution. And for those of you familiar with the global burden of disease study, um, this will now be a new risk outcome pair in the GBD 2020 study coming out next year. Um, and so what we estimate is, is that in 125 major cities, the percent of new pediatric asthma cases that were attributable to NO2 ranged all the way up to 48%, and that was in Shanghai. Um, I've just put a red box here uh, for the cities, in, for some of the cities in, in China. Um, but what this is showing is that, so the, for that Shanghai result, that shows that almost half of new cases of, of asthma among kids can be attributable to traffic-related nitrogen dioxide pollution. Um, and that that fraction exceeds 20% in 92 cities, and those are cities all over China as well as the rest of the world. Um, so in cities all over the world, NO2 is a major contributor to pediatric asthma incidents. Um, so we wanted to tease out, you know, what is the what is the influence of the human activity changes on nitrogen dioxide? And it's impossible to do that without understanding the meteorological influence. Um, NO2 actually has a very strong seasonal cycle, and you can see that in the bigger graph here on the left, showing how nitrogen dioxide changes in seven U.S. cities throughout the year. And you see that over here in starting in January, um, NO2 starts to increase in most cities. I'll just follow this highest curve here for Chicago, um, where it peaks in March. Uh, so it's a very wintertime uh, pollutant. And then it starts to drop just naturally throughout the springtime and the summer. And then it starts to increase again throughout the fall and winter. And so you see when the lockdowns were happening in the United States in the March to April timeframe, Nitrogen dioxide was just naturally already dropping. This is data based on 2019. This is way well before the pandemic. NO2 always drops in that time frame in the springtime in the United States. So how are we to understand what is the contribution of the pandemic versus the seasonal cycle? The other thing that um, is a major influence on NO2 concentrations is daily wind changes. So wind speed has a massive influence. And as you can see, as the wind gets uh, stronger and faster, NO2 goes down. Wind direction also has a big influence. And the, the direction of influence depends on the location and what uh, emission sources are upstream. So we implemented some approaches to try to understand what are the, what are the influences of meteorology versus um, versus human activity on NO2 concentrations. And you can see those results here, and I'm not going to go through this in the interest of time, but just to show that uh, in, among 20 North American cities um, in the box here on the right, about half of the drop in NO2 experienced during the pandemic were due to the human activity changes, and about half was due to the meteorological changes. And I just want to uh, make one additional uh, point here before concluding, which is that in many cities, the, uh, the post-lockdown NO2 amounts in the least white communities across the United States were still about 50% larger than the pre-lockdown NO2 amounts in the most white communities. And you can see that, for example, here in this plot showing NO2 concentrations um, for the least white uh, communities in the United States in the orange versus the most white communities in the blue. The top bar for each location is the baseline period and the bottom bar is the lockdown. And so we can see that the um, NO2 concentrations dropped for both the least white census tracts as well as the most white census tracts. Um, but yet we still had quite a bit of disparity in the least white and most white census tracts in terms of how much NO2 they were exposed to. And these types of results also hold for income and educational attainment. And I'm just going to um, see that I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to skip over to my conclusions to just say that we found that physical distancing led to substantial NO2 drops in North American cities, and that was aided in some locations by favorable meteorology. 
We found that despite decreases for communities that are less white, lockdowns did not eliminate disparities by race in the United States. But there's many unknown still. Um, we don't know what are the factors that are driving inconsistencies and NOx emission drops between locations. We think that traffic has uh, traffic and vehicle fuel mix has a large uh, influence, but we're investigating that now. And then finally, just to say that PM 2.5 and ozone are much more complex than NO2. They're very location specific. They're driven by emissions, meteorology, and atmospheric chemistry. And I wanted to highlight a study that was done for China showing that there was actually quite a mixed effect of the pandemic on ozone and PM 2.5 due to um, things like humidity and atmospheric chemistry. Um, there's quite a bit of research that's out there. I've really only scratched the surface um, and I'm happy to talk more about that uh, if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, 然后汇报主要是从这三个方面来展开和健康之间的一个交叉科学土壤健康、土壤服务、生态系统健康、生态系统服务一个是流行病学等 到目前2020年，总共就发发布了四期。那么在2019年的时候，GeoHealth获得了两个奖项，这两个奖都是比较重量级的奖项，是分别是美国出版商协会颁发的科学技术和医学的最佳新期刊奖，这个是右右下角这
，妇女同行评审，正常会邀请两到三个领域的一个专家来进行同行评审。第二种类型是 review article， 也就是所谓的综述性论文。综述性论文的话，这里有一点需要大家注意一下，就是所有的综述性论文都是需要提前。和这个编辑进行交流的，也就是说，如果你想给 g e o h e a l t h 投一篇 review article 的话，你事先要需要在，呃 g e o h e a l t h 的这个期刊主页上和某位 editor 或者是 chief editor 取得联系，然后征得他的同意之后，你可能才能够去投这个 review article。那么在这个投稿的时候，你可以在你的那 cover letter， 就是你的 cover letter 里面可以写出来说，我这个是一个 review article。然后我这个稿件已经和我们 g e o h e a l t h 期刊的某位编辑已经沟通过，他同意投稿，标明这样就可以。那么还有，除了这个 research article 和 review article 以外，还有其他的一些稿那个稿件的文章的类型，例如说是评论啊、回复啊，还有一些呃个人视角啊等等，这个可能相对来说是一个小众一些的。那么具体的要求，在那个 g e o h e a l t h 的投稿投稿的一个页面上，也都会有一个详尽的描述。呃，这里另外的话，我想讲一下，就是 g e o h e a l t h 目前是实行严格的单盲评审。所谓的单盲评评审的话，就是作者是不知道审稿人是谁的，但是审稿人知道这个稿件的作者是谁。和此和它相对应的是双盲评审。双盲评审就是。审稿人不知道这个稿件的作者是谁，这个作者也不知道这个稿件的审稿人是谁。那么现在整个科学科学期刊领域里面，百分我记得一个统计数据是百分之九十四的期刊都是实行单盲评审。其实我本人是比较比较喜欢双盲评审的，因为双盲评审我我觉得会会更更客观一些。但是双盲评审也有它的一个很很大的不弊端吧。就是很多时候会把这个稿件的处理速度会延迟很多，所以这也是呃为什么绝大部分期刊目前都是在推行 single b r i d e 就是单盲评审、呃。第二部分我想简单的介绍一下，就是我们在作为一个编辑，然后来处理一个稿件的整个流程。这是一个通函评审的一个流程，我自己画了一个图，好像。我昨天看的时候，好像有一个有一点点，有些地方可能需要待会重点解释一下。首先呢，就是在作者投来一个投来一个新的稿件之后，我们的编辑办公室他会对这个稿件进行一个质量和一个查重的一个检查。那么如果说是，例如说某一些重复率过高，或者说出现一些重大的一个技术上的问题的话，可能在这个编辑办公室这一这一块就直接就拒稿了。那么，如果通过了这些查重或者是一些技术审查之后没问题，那么他会接收之后将这个稿件交给 chief editor， 就是交给主编。那么，主编在浏览这个稿件之后，根据这个这稿件的主题、核心词，还有所研究的区域等等一些呃指标来分配这个学科编辑 academic editor。那么，这个呃学科编辑呢，又会在根据自己的方向上的一些副主编的一个任务量、工作量和一些研究的一个专业，来选择副主编来处理这个稿件。当然，这个学科编辑也可以自己处理这个稿件。那么，在这个学科编辑呃选定完这个副主编之后，副主编就开始邀请 review reviewer 邀请审稿人。那么，邀请完审稿人之后，审稿。这一项工作是一个最我们在处理稿件的时候花的时间最多的一块，就是去寻找和去邀请和寻找合适的审稿人。那么一旦我们找到合适的审稿人之后，审稿人对于这个稿件进行一个评审和给出他的意见，这些意见再返回到这个 associate editor 手上。那么这个副主编根据这个审稿人的意见来决定这个稿子是他的建议是拒稿。从头、大修、中修、小修，还是直接接收？但是他只有一个建议权，他的这个权限，他的这个建议提交在系统里填写完之后，最终是由这个学科编辑和这个主编来决定 make a decision， 来决定这个稿子最终是他的一个状态和决定是什么样子的。那么，假如说这个时候
主编给出来一个决定是大修，那么就会将这个意见返回到投稿的作者手上，然后投稿的作者根据这个 ed i t o r 和这个 reviewer 的一个意见，对稿件进行修改，修改完之后重新再返回到这个学科编辑手上，然后再来第二轮，有可能还会有第三轮，一直到最后，这个主编和这个学科编辑。认为这个稿件质量是 OK 了，那么他就同意接收，最终稿件去交给出版出版社去排队刊刊印。这个是整个一个呃同行拼印的一个流程。我我相信除了这个 Geo Health、AGU 的其他期刊或者 i s w a r e 或者是其他出版社的期刊的一个流程，大同小异，都是这么样一个一个流程。这里我先展示的一个我们这个审稿。就是编辑登录系统之后所能看到的一个一个界面，就是，呃，首先我会比较感兴趣的先看一点，就是一个查重 ，cross check。我这里举了一个例子，就是我们有一篇稿子，出于对这个投稿投稿作者的一个保密吧，我把相关的题目什么都给隐隐藏起来了。那么我们在 editor 一登录进来之后，我们会处理接收了一个新的稿件处理的时候，我们就会看到这篇稿件。它的重复率是多少？例如说，我这个举的这个例子，它的重复率是 19% 哦，百分我们目前默认还是 OK 的，是就是说是通过了一个查重检查，那么我们就开始移移到移到下一步去去邀请审稿人，这个就是会做一个查重检查。那么现在绝大部分的那个期刊，它都会选用 Authenticate。这个平台系统来作为一个查重界面，来作为一个查重。那么我刚才上面举了个例子，百分之十九的这个稿重复率的这个稿件，如果我们点开百分之十九的话，它这个会可以显示出来，所有的重复率是来来自于一二三四五六七八九十十一十二等等。这个每个数字代表的是一个文献或者报告或者网页，就是它的重复率是来自于来自于哪一个数据源的。那么根据这个，我们来可以可以对编辑有一个更重要的一个判断，有可能，例如说我投了一个稿子，它的重复率是比较高的，但是我们编辑在点开这个重复率的数据进行进一步分析的时候，发现它可能某一两个重复率比较高的数据源是来自于他前期发表过的文献的话，就是他本人自己发表过的文献的话，我们可能会。对这种情况，会相对来说会给予一定的包容度。但是如果说是大量的重复率是来自于其他人的文献，或者是英特网上的其他文字的话，我们对这种包容度会相对低一些。这个是查重。第二点的话，是我们编辑会比较在意的是一个数据，例如说这是我处理稿件的另外一个另外一个稿件作为例子吧。那么我们在登录进来接受这个稿子之后，我们看这个。是在这个 PPT 的左边，就会有一个一个很小的一个一个 note， 一个提示。这个这个东西是由这个整个 AGU 期刊的工技术工作人员来做的。他会提醒 editor 说，例如说是这个稿件缺缺少一个数据声明，也就是说需要作者给他的稿件给他的工作提供可重复的一个数据的一个获取方式。那么根据 AGU 的数据政策的话，像以我以我们这个稿子为例，由于这个作者没有提供相应的数据获取链接，那么这个就这里就显示的是建议拒稿，然后鼓励作者重新投稿。这也是为什么目前 AGO 的一个数据政策已经越来越来越要求所有的投稿作者要求有一个这个 replicated， 就是可重复性。那么所有的这个数据是。必须要可获取到的，它这个可获取到的方式，我们可以作者可以在你的正文当中，或者是在你的致谢当中，把你的数据的一个链接给提供出来。那么如果没有提供的话，有可能就会不会进行外审，直接就拒稿，建议作者补充相应的材料。这个是数据，我们我们 ed editor 在处理稿件的时候比较在意的第二点，数据政策方面。第四呃。我这里还是，我我再看一眼啊，我这里少了一少了一个 slide 是吗？好，到这里是第三第三个是我们 review editor 比较花了大量时间在做的工作，就是要 invalid 
reviewers 邀请宣告人。那么这个 slide 是来自一个呃 Doctor Lu， 他给了一个建议，就是呃在邀请宣告人的时候，无效的建议，例如说你邀请的是你的一个本单位的、同学院的、同一个研究机构的同同事来作为这个稿子的宣告人，这种这种宣告人基本上是不会被采纳的。第二种是无效的建议是。您邀请的这个，你建议的这个审稿人，在您的这个学科领域里面，并不是很出名，尤其是在中国以外的区域，不是很出名。那么这个没有一定的知名度，那这个可能也，这种建议，呃 ，suggested reviewer 也不是会容易被采纳的。那么比较有效的审稿人的建议是什么呢？第一个是在这个学科领域里面有一个比较好的知名度。第二个的话是，如现在越来越。大家如果有注意的话，现在越来越多的投稿系统，或者说啊、呃、某一些评审平台，都会建议让大家提供 O I C D 号。O I C D 号是每个研究者的，相当于说是唯一识别的身份证号，它背后可以关联上很多很多的数据统计信息。那么，假如说我们在提供一个呃推荐审稿人的时候，担心这个审稿人可能没有足够的知名度。但是他确实对您这个领域的方向是完全切合的。那么你可以将这个是推荐审稿的 O I C D 号一并附上，这会对呃 editor 在选决定是否选用这个推荐审稿人的时候会有很大的一个帮助。那么这个是整个 A G U 系统都是这样。那我截图的，我这个截图的是 Geo Health 的一个一个界面。我们在邀请审稿人的时候，会大量的依据这个，就是 A G U 系统或者叫 Value 系统的一个呃评评审稿人系统吧。那么我们像我本人的话，主要收到一个稿件之后，主要就会根据稿子的题目、关键词和一些核心词，然后在这里面输入一些就是。研究方向，我们在这里面可以选择很多研究方向，根据这个研究方向来进行一个筛选。它的筛选方式有两种，一种的话是根据 v a l u e 自带的一个数据库，第二种方式的话是结合 Google Scholar 谷歌学术来进行筛选。当然，右侧会链接上就是呃作者推荐的宣告人。那么我们在处理稿子的时候，正常我本人正常不会太。轻易的去用作者推荐的审稿人，而我倾向于自己去根据我自己的判断来选择审稿人。这是第三个，编辑在处理稿件的时候，主要这个是要花大量的时间的。那么第四块需要注意的是，我们目前会遇到一些情况，例如说是就是一个作者顺顺序，或者是一个作者的改变。呃，这是一个例子，就是我们前段时间处理的一篇稿子。那么我们在第二轮，就是作者返回修改稿之后，我们会发现这个作者的顺序顺序没变，增加了一个新作者。我们会在这 PPT 当中，我们可以看到这个黄色的一个提醒框，黄橙色的这个提醒框，这个也是一个呃投稿系统的一个工作人员给予的，他会提醒这个 editor， 就是说第四个排排位第四的一个作者是一个新增加的作者。他会提醒 editor 来做一个判断。那么在这个时候的话，我们正常会将稿子返回给作者，让让作者提供一个说明，就是为什么会改变作者的那个数量，或者是改变作者的顺序。新增的作者是否有提供新的贡献，或者说作者的顺序的调放是有什么理由和依据？需要补充这个说明之后，我们才会进一步将这个稿子进行下一步的那个流移到下一个流程当中。那么这个是来这个 Doctor Su 的一个 slides， 它是讲的是呃主要据到目前为止主要据稿的一些主主要的原因吧。第一个的话是就是你的研究太基于区域化了，就是太 local 了。第二个的话是您的这个研究技术性太强太强，那么就会影响读者的受众群。第三个的话是创新性不够。第四个的话是就是。读者的兴趣的感兴趣的读者数量过少。第五个的话是，目前我们国内稿件可能会比较多的一个问题，就是写作语法和这个文论文的组织结构上可能有些问题。这个是几个主要的被拒稿的原因。
。然后另外的话是，前面的五个相对来说是一个技术层面的，然后后面这四个相对来说是一个呃研究和协作方面的。例如说是对对于您的一个结果缺乏足够的合理的解释。第二个的话是对你的方法缺乏足够的描述，第三个的话是对于你所提供的数据并不能够完全支撑你的结论，啊，第四个的话是你的这个研究综述，呃，不够全面、啊。最后我用两个片子来简单的介绍一下 g e o h e a l t h 在发展了三年之后，啊，现在应该算第四年了，发展了四年之后的一些一些统计数据吧。这个是两个对比图，呃，我们分别是展示的是来自于，就是作者，来自于的区域。我们先看左上角的，这个是所有的 w i l e w i l e 期刊的一个作者分布。我们可以看到，百分之三十一的作者是来自于中国，百分之二十八的作者是来自于美国，然后其他的是，呃，呃，亚洲剩下的部分百分之十二。然后英国、法国、德国百分之十一等等，这是所有期刊的。那么我们再来看右下角 g e o h e a l t h 这个期刊的话，啊，作者数最多的是美国，接近一半，达到百分之四十八。中国的作者只有百分之十八，也就是相比 g e o h e a l t h 这个期刊的作者分布区域和所有外围期刊的作者分布区域的话，我发现就是目前确实来自于中国的稿件，投的投向 g e o h e a l t h 的中国的稿件。还是相对比较少的，那么这也是希望啊、呃，大家以后可以积极的向 g e o h e a l t h 进行投稿。如果您认为您的这个研究工作和 g e o h e a l t h 的主旨、研究方向吻合的话，欢迎大家来进行投稿。那么 g e o h e a l t h 总得展示一些优势是什么？我们知道，审稿的速度、处理稿件的速度，对于一个作者来说是非常关键的。我们这里我我收集的就是二零二零年 Q 一、Q 二、Q 三，也就是第一季度、第二季度、第三季度的处理稿件的顺序，啊、呃，速度。这里的单位是天，我们就来看中位数吧。我们先来看第二列，是二零二零年第一季度的处理稿件的一个速度的中位数。从你投稿到开始外审，中时间是六天。从你投稿到第一轮。decision 出来，平均是四十四天，从你投稿到论文接收，平均是一百一十三天，这是第一季度的结果。第二季度的话，速度会进一步加快，从你投稿到外审，三天，从你投稿到第一轮意见出来，三十五天，从你投稿到论文直接接收是平均七十三天。那么 Q 三第三季度是四四十一。九十四，我们将三个季度进行平均，可以分别发现是四天、四十天和九十三天。那么这个数据可能没有一个直观的概念，我们去和 w i r e 其他期刊进行一个比较。如果将 w i r e 其他所有的期刊的一个平均数来看的话，他们从就是从投稿到外审，平均需要十天 g e o h e a l t h 只需要四天。从投稿到第一轮意见出来。呃 w i r e 所有的期刊需要的时间是六十天 g e o h e a l t h 四十天。从投稿到直接发表，呃 w i r e 所有的期刊平均时间是需要一百四十九天，也就是接近五个月。呃 g e o h e a l t h 的话是三个月九十三天。这个是从速度上 g e o h e a l t h 因为目前确实是一个呃刚刚发展起来的期刊，它的稿源数不多，所以处理的速度会相对会快一些。呃，如果大家对自己的工作，啊，质量比较有信心，同时对于速度要求比较快的话，可以考虑给 g e o h e a l t h 投稿。啊，以上就是我的一个简单的汇报的内容。大家有问题的话，可以随时提问交流。谢谢。